Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Tanya Lyon. I'm here with Sony. We're going to talk a little bit about the Venice 2. Uh, but before we do that, let's, um, let's take a look back at the original Venice. Let's roll the video. So the original Venice has been out for about four years. It's been used on over 400 productions, including Top Gun Maverick, which will come out next month. Um, and the Venice 2 really builds upon the success of the original Venice. Um, it's available with either the original um, 6K sensor that you can find in the original Venice, the Venice 2, and then or with a revolutionary new 8K sensor. So when people say like 8K, I think what we're always expecting is like very hyper digital look, like seeing pores on skin, lines that maybe you can't even see with your naked eye. But as you can see, this shot was done by Gonzalo Amat. He used only available light in his shoot and didn't use any film filters. And you can see that her skin still looks very natural, very film-like. And the Venice 2 has a smaller form factor. It's about 44 millimeters smaller. It has internal recording, so there we lost the R7 recorder. And it has this revolutionary new sensor, which we'll go into more detail on. So the Venice 2 is uh, slightly shorter. It's about 44 millimeters shorter than the original Venice. And that, we've tested it on gimbals, on uh, Steadicams, Hydroflex, and that smaller size has helped operators so they don't have to carry as much weight. And it also means you can use longer lenses when you're putting it in a shot over. Um, but the big story with the Venice 2 is really the sensor. So the sensor offers just incredible detail. This shot was done in the middle of the desert with Oscar-winning cinematographer Claudio Miranda. And you can see just incredible detail. It does have a dual base ISO like the original Venice. But what's different is the ISO. It's an 800 and 3200 dual base ISO. So the last shot you saw was at 800. And this shot, which was also done in the desert, it was completely pitch black to the eye. We couldn't see where we were walking. Um, but you can see that the camera could still pick all of this detail up with very little noise. And this was shot at um, 3200. We're seeing a lot of cinematographers who are using the camera, like Claudio, using the 3200 for underwater shots, night, and they're also finding that they um, don't have to use as much practical lighting uh, due to the 3200. But like I mentioned before, the, the best part of this new sensor is really the natural skin tones. So again, with this shot, which was a screen grab taken from uh, Gonzalo Amat, who did Man in the High Castle and Outer Banks, you get this amazing film-like detail without being hyper-digital. And then we really listen to our like customers and cinematographers. And so I know this is a very bright shot. This was taken facing the sun with the Zeiss radiance lenses. But you can see that the camera handles highlights much differently than the original Venice does. The highlights now roll off. It's a really beautiful look. Now to be outdone though, the new sensor also offers a high dynamic range. It offers 16 stops of dynamic range versus the 15 for the original Venice. This was taken from another screen grab from a Titleist commercial by uh, Kurt Morgan. So here we have a chart with the 16 stops of dynamic range with a dual base ISO. So you're able, if you're not familiar with the dual base ISO, you can kind of shift where the dynamic range will go depending on the 800 or the 3200. Other features um, include the internal recording, um, supports full frame and super 35 modes, uh, capable of shooting XOCN internally or 4K ProRes. So uh, we've had other shoots with, like, with Claudio, with other commercials where people just decided to shoot in the ProRes. You don't have to shoot 8K, it's just offered. Um, LED display supports 12 volt or 24 volt and also an internal mic for scratch audio. 
The reason why I wanted to include this slide, though, is because blue light is very difficult for cinematographers on skin tones. And what this did was it shows the incredible color separation that the sensor has. And if you visit this back wall back here, you can see some of the the um, productions that use the original Venice. And then we have playing a um, Gonzalo Amat showreel on this wall using only available light. And on the opposite wall, we have a short showreel cut together of different productions that have already started using the Venice 2. And you can see how other cinematographers have used it. And I think with that, let's roll the video and you can hear how Rob McLaughlin, the cinematographer from Game of Thrones, uh, you can see how he tested the camera and what his thoughts are in the video. Let's roll the video. I've made my favorite images ever in my career with the Sony Venice. And I thought, well, if this is that much better, we're going to be able to make something really amazing with it. I love this because we've got this nice soft light coming in, and a nice Vermeer light, no, only natural light. And um, let's, um, let's have our little visit. Oh, okay. This is raw camera with clean Zeiss Supreme lenses and Fuji Premista zooms. 3-2 aspect ratio, the entire full frame sensor in 8.6K so that there's nothing between the cinematographers who are going to be watching this and the camera itself. Yeah, very nice. Let's, shall we put a tighter lens on, get, you know, over? What Robert is trying to do is showcase the camera. It's a case of being able to use the camera as you would in the field with no lighting indoors and out. Hi. And up you go. I want to know what that image is to start with before I start modifying it. And that's what I'm trying to show everybody with this by keeping it as clean and simple as we possibly can. You know, we're using the full dynamic range all the time, almost always. It's heavily, heavily overcast, but you know, that sky, normally that sky would like white out on us, and it's, it's it, I, think, I think it's gonna hang on. That rising mist is beautiful. Well, it's got a much deeper latitude, and we played around with a 3200 underwater and with the fire the other night, which was really interesting to see. I mean, looking at this, I mean, I'm seeing detail of those, you know, of the windows. It's unbelievable. It's amazing seeing, like I was talking about the color tones and how it, they roll off so nice and, and so gracefully, especially with just the skin tones. We also were in amazing areas where, I mean, there was a lot of ooing and aahing at what people were seeing every time. Wow. So it was like obvious to everybody that this sensor was performing superior to the previous sensor, which people have been very excited about already. The huge battle scene in season seven in Game of Thrones, we used literally every camera conveyance available. I want to see that camera put through every possible situation. So we're using it in drone, we're using it in aerial gimbal mounts on a helicopter, we're putting it in underwater housing, you know, we're hand holding it and putting it on the steady cam. Even with these billboards here, if we were out here with like whatever else, we'd have like a musco up the street, another one or BB light down the other way. Um, I think it would be smart to sell your stock in BB lights right now. Blacks look solid. It's hanging on to detail in this incredibly bright billboard really well. Um, but digging into the shadows. I'd be shooting wide open. Maybe not right under these billboards when they get bright, but um, we'd be we'd be shooting wide open and have need a bunch of big lights everywhere. And right now, we're 3200 ISO. And we're shooting at an eight stop. It's not good. Even on it's here, it's clean. Very impressive. Out here in the desert, what I really wanted to do was to put it to the test in terms of really strong contrast with no additional fill light. It's great being able to shoot the sky, but also hold mid, mid the mid-tones and holding, you know, lot, really digging into the blacks. It's fantastic. If you're doing a driving shot inside a car and you're panning from outside to in, or you want to hold both the, the, the detail in the driver's face and the hot background, you had to pump a pile of light through the front windshield. There was no, just no two ways about it. So I wanted to demonstrate how well it holds both ends of the spectrum, because it's really going to free filmmakers up let's take it somewhere with some scenery and stuff that we haven't seen before in these things. And to that end, I wanted to bring it up to, to British Columbia, Canada. As you can probably see, the weather's not too reliable here. We're on Hornby Island, and we're trying to get a sense of the epic scale and scope and the natural beauty of the place. And 
you know, trying to show off. You know, we've been big fans of the Sony Venice for a long time. We've been working on Ghostbusters to Jurassic World to the Deadpool movies. And yeah, it's super important to, you know, get your hands on the, on the gear and do the testing. One of the few complaints about the original Venice from both assistants and everybody else was, you know, it was a, it, 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 it was a little bit heavy camera by the time they got all their accoutrement and, and, and accessories attached to it. I like the way it's set up now without the extra recorder is great. Being able to take that R7 recorder off and have it built in, even already our drone guys are saying, oh, this is so much easier to deal with. And uh, can you calibrate, please? The camera is in a much tighter package. For the gyro-stabilized gimbals, it's actually easier, much more compact. Smaller cameras just allow us to get in real tighter, take the viewer really into the action, um, especially drones, which are, we're sort of being constantly asked to use them like a thousand foot techno crane where we're starting in, you know, this tight and pulling out to these crazy big, you know, wide scale epic shots. We got a drone up on some bluffs at sunrise and then the sun popped through absolutely blazing off the water, you know, kicking off the water like crazy, but also with some deep shadows in the foreground because it hadn't, you know, the, the skylight hadn't come up enough to fill it in and uh, it looks amazing. What I'm trying to think about different tools I can use to, um, you know, bring the viewer into the action and I'm kind of known as a bit of an action guy, then I think the Sony Venice 2 is gonna fit the bill beautifully. We've been really enjoying the Venice 2, using it inside the underwater housing. We use the Hydroflex housing almost exclusively. There you go, somewhere there, that's good. So today we're out there and we had the dark BC waters, as we do. For underwater photography, you want, you know, sun directly overhead, and we had overcast. The fact that the base ISO have been increased a bit, with the 3200 and the 800, has been fantastic. There you go. I didn't notice any noise when we were half in, half out and close to the surface of the water. But when we tilted down and we were doing the deeper stuff, we were at our 3200 base. When we're shooting underwater, I'd say 90% of the time we're in dark environments. We don't ha often have a motivation for a light source underwater other than surface lighting. It's always the god light and there was no noise. It still had a little bit of brightness, but it was nice and clean. The Venice 2 at 3200 is amazingly clean and we just used it for our underwater work and it's a murky day you can't see very well underwater normally it would be you know it'd almost be a washout it's rich and amazing here we go we're rolling one, two, one, two. it's been a pleasure using this camera uh, through this testing period with rob for the past couple days uh, it has been a true pleasure and an honor I'm going to hang the rig up after this show, so this is my last Steadicam show. There's 125 features. I think 45 years of Steadicam's probably enough for me. It has been a little bit easier to rig, and certainly the factory has thought out mounting points, at least from the Steadicam point of view. The menu is very simple. Uh, the camera is very simple to use and user-friendly. It's not as confusing as the older, earlier models. And it's been amazing at 8K. Uh, and it's got some really simple features that work very well. Uh, I'm quite impressed with the whole thing. It's great. Uh, the dynamic range and the weight of the camera has made it so much easier uh, going on and off drones, going on to Steadicam, handheld. So the size of this camera and the compactness of it is going to make a great asset to any set. So yes, I guess it's the way of the future. I just wish like heck that I'd had this camera when I was shooting those big epic Game of Thrones episodes because, um, you, know, the, the, you know, just the scope and the detail and the richness and the three-dimensionality of that quality of a picture is just that much greater and therefore I think that much more um, engrossing and, and involving.